Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you this evening, and thank you so much for the invitation to be with you during this special series, winter lectures, I guess you're calling them. And I think I'm turned on. My wife says, turn it on, turn it on. <laughs> I'm used to that. But anyway, we're happy to be with you, my wife and I. My wife's name is Linda. And uh, it's been some time since we've been up in this area for any length of time. We spent a few years in Alliance back in 72, 73, so that's been a while ago. But it's good to be with you this evening. I've been assigned the topic of forgiving. And this shouldn't be a hard subject for us, but really it is. And for us to understand that we need to give time and attention to this thought of imitators of Christ and for and forgiving. You know, we can't live in this world very long before we get hurt. I'm sure if I asked all of you this evening who has been hurt by someone, most of our hands would go up. I know mine would. And it's hard to imagine that we can live in life and do the best we can, but yet sometimes things are done, things are said, things are left undone that it just crawls up on us and we get hurt by it. And because of that, we, we often wonder, what am I to do? And I know some people personally that just are dark inside because they've been hurt. And they've not known what to do with that hurt inside of them. And as a result, they have walked away from the Lord. They have caused their life to turn to darkness. And they can't, they can't hear anything when it comes to God's word. Maybe some of you have walked into this building tonight that you've struggled with something. Maybe a burden has been on your shoulders. Maybe, maybe something has been done or you feel like you've been wounded or mistreated or, or victimized. Well, that's very, very much possible. But what do we do in reference to that? And really that's the crux of my lesson tonight is to open God's word and to listen to what he has to say. Because sometimes we just don't give time and attention to this thought of forgiveness. And that's the reason I'd like to begin with this passage that I had up on the screen a minute ago, what we find in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 14 through 15. Read it with, with me, if you will. It says, If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. You know, it's good just to park yourself right there for a while. And to realize that forgiveness and forgiving, it goes both ways. You can't have one without the other and find peace with God. And that's the important thing that we realize. And Jesus made it clear in this passage that we need to understand what forgiveness is all about. We need to understand what it means to forgive and how to seek forgiveness Matter of fact, there shouldn't be any doubt or discussion when it comes to this after reading this passage. And that's what our whole series is on here. Matter of fact, in being imitators of Christ. My, my question was when I received this from, from uh, and, I, and I thought, are we really concerned about imitating Christ? Does that really come up in our minds? It should. Because we are Christians, we're supposed to be Christ-like, we're supposed to be doing those things that harmonize with God's word and pleases him, but sometimes things can happen to us that hurt us, that cause us to feel bad towards someone, or maybe, maybe we've done something to someone that has caused them to feel bad about us, and what do we do? Do we just let it go? Do we let it fester? And sometimes that's what happens. And then we wonder sometimes why people act so strange with us. We, we wonder why they're doing what they're doing. And maybe sometimes we wonder why they're not in attendance anymore. 
Or maybe our, our neighbors don't talk to us like they used to. It all may come down to something we've done or something they've done, and we don't know what to do about it. That's what makes this topic so important. We need to understand what Jesus said here if we have any desire to be right before him. Because we find that he says that if we desire to be forgiven from God, we're going to have to forgive others. Then that means I've got to understand this. I've got to understand what, what, what he says with all of this. And, and because of that, it brings to mind a number of passages. You know, when we, think, when we consider Bible forgiveness, what do you think of usually? Does a passage pop in your mind? Maybe that one in Matthew chapter 6 does, where Jesus says, if we want to be forgiven by God, we're going to have to forgive others. But I like the passage found also in Ephesians. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. You know, the first part of the, the book of Ephesians talks about doctrinal things and about the very fact of Christ being our Savior. But when we come to the fourth chapter, we find that the application comes before us, where we find that we need to apply what, what, is, what has been said by Paul to be able to do what we need to do and feel the way we should feel. In the last part of that fourth chapter, the very last verse, listen to what Paul says. He says, be kind to one another. Really? Yes. If we understand what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. But he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. But you know, we might come to that passage and say, but you don't know what's been done to me. You don't know how I feel. And I just can't get past this. That happens sometimes to us. And that's why we come to the Bible. That's why we come to God's word. To listen to what God has to say. Let's, let's read the passage again. It says, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now that should make it clear. We need to make... We need to make sure that we take care of these situations in life that become dark and dismal for us. Because if we're going to learn anything about being like Christ in the area of forgiving, we're going to have to learn what these passages say to us and then knowing how to apply that to us. And that's really the crux of our lesson tonight is to look at six different things that, that are true about Christ, that are true about God, and then to move to make that a part of our lives. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying that when someone hurts us that we just can turn a page and that'll be it. It takes application as it is with all of the things. You know, the devil does his very best to use the world against us. We understand that. And he'll use situations, he'll use various aspects to turn us into dark individuals, but we can't let that happen. And that's why we study that's why we open God's word. Because we realize that here in Ephesians chapter 4, it mentions that we are to forgive one another even as, I think that's the King James rendering there, even as God forgives us. In other words, we're to do the same thing, do it in the same manner. Or using our special word tonight, we need to imitate that. That it won't come overnight, but it comes as a process as we grow as Christians, and how important that is. And so we ask ourselves, well, how is, it, how is this done? How do, I, how, do I, how do I clear this up in my heart that has weighted me down, and I need to do something because I just don't feel right about this person, or that person just doesn't feel right about me? What do I need to do? Well, let's, let's go together and look at the various portions of what we have here because we realize the importance we are to forgive others just as God has forgiven us in the same manner we're to imitate Jesus Christ and thus we need to look at six characteristics of God's forgiveness that we might have that ourselves and if we can do that then we can be pleasing to God you know there's a passage that I keep coming back to it's found in 2nd Corinthians and, and, I, and I'm moved by this passage because of what Paul says 
in the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. He talks about uh, our, our, our existence here on earth and what we desire to have eventually. But there's something said here in verse 9. If you'd like to read that with me or listen as I read this. It says in verse 9, Therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, I, I underlined this, to be pleasing to him. Isn't that our goal while we're here in this life? To do what God wants us to do that we might be pleasing to him. Why? Because the next verse tells us. It says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be reconciled for his deeds in the body, whether he has done, whether it is good or bad, to be pleasing to him. So that's our purpose tonight, is to look at six different things that we find about God and about what Christ does what he's willing to do and why we should be willing to do the same. The first of which deals with God's willing to forgive willingly. What do I mean by that? And simply, I mean by that is that no one forces God to forgive. There's no one back behind God pushing him in a direction of, now you've got to forgive those folks down there. No. No. No one forces God to forgive. He forgives because he's willing, because he's loving, because he's merciful. And because of that, we look at a passage in 2 Peter. And when we read this passage in 2 Peter, we, we realize that, that God has his own timetable. We don't know what it is. But God is willing, he's desiring that we all come to repentance. But he's patient. One of the things that I pray to God every evening is the fact that I thank him for being patient with me. That he's willing to allow time to pass that I can come that much closer to him. And that he's willing to forgive me. We know this passage well. 2 Peter chapter 3. It says... In verse 9, that the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's waiting on me. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on all of those that we can talk to to come to repentance. But no one pushes him in this direction. That's who God is. We find that God forgives willingly. Now, what does that mean about you and me? It means that we should be striving toward that same type of disposition. We must be willing to forgive out of mercy, out of love in our heart. Maybe that's the problem with us sometimes. We just don't have the love in our heart to forgive the person that abused and misused us. And we might say, well, I just, I just can't until we come to understand what has God done to forgive me? God, God has forgiven me of some things that I, I've not told anyone about. Well, the simple fact that I know who God is. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, we find that Jesus said on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, if we want, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, does that, does that include us? You bet it does. I'm supposed to be merciful to those that I deal with if I expect God to be merciful to me. And when I stand on the day of judgment face to face with my Lord, he's going to look me in the face and see whether I've been as merciful as I should have been. And I think that's what is being spoken about here. And then also over in... in 1 Peter chapter 4, since we're close by. 1 Peter chapter 4, another passage that you might consider with me. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse, verse 8. Peter says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. We find it hard sometimes for someone that stepped all over us. 
And those sins may be apparent just as much as the day is long for us. But because of what Jesus says here, and Peter writes it down, he says, we need to be filled with love. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. God forgives willingly. How about us? But secondly, God also forgives aggressively. And I, and I don't use that word lightly. I believe we understand that God takes the first action to forgive. We know John 3.16 well, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Did the world act first in loving God? No. God loved the world first. That's why he sent Jesus Christ into a world filled with sin and sorrow. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. People put that on billboards today, but they, they, they fail to understand the fact that that calls us to come to him. He has first loved us. He forgives us first and foremost. And then we must take the initiative. Um, turn over to the 18th chapter. We're going to look at this twice, matter of fact. But let's, let's look at just verses 15 through 17. Matthew chapter 18. And I read this because it was just last Sunday that someone came up to me and told me about how someone had hurt her. And she said to me, what, what am I to do? And I'd been working on this lesson, and it just, it just popped in my mind. says, don't you realize what, what Matthew chapter 18 says? Let's read it together. In verse 15, it says, And if your brother sins, or some translation says, If your brother sins against you, go and reprove him in private. And if he listens to you, you've, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every, every fact may be confirmed or established. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church that he may, that if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile, and one that it says also as a tax collector. So what's being said here? It tells us that we need to take the initiative if someone has done us wrong, do we just let it fester? Do we avoid them? I remember one time, uh, the first place that I began preaching full time, I, I learned a number of things about the brethren there and, and, and with another congregation close by. And they said they had problems with the brethren. As this, as this building is separated with an aisle down the middle, they said that, there would be brethren that would sit on this side of the building and others that would sit on this side of the building and they wouldn't talk to each other. If they met each other on the street, they would cross over so they wouldn't have to be on the same side of the street with each other. Do Christians act like that? You know the answer. No. There was definitely a problem there with forgiving. And we find that we're told and even we see it in God himself that God is the one that steps forth to forgive us first and foremost. Where would we be if that wasn't the case? And sometimes we can't see beyond our nose. We can't see what God is expecting of us because we just have this individual inside personal feeling that our feelings are more important than anyone else's. And we've got to stop long enough to listen to what God has to say. God forgives aggressively but also he forgives absolutely and this is where it really pins us down it really does god forgives sin completely without reservation now just like we read the passage in second corinthians chapter five where it says that we're going to stand before the lord someday and give an account whether things have been good or bad And because of that, we're going to have to think about what we've done today, what we've, what we've done yesterday, and what we're going to do tomorrow. 
is, is it what needs to be done? Do we have everything crystal clear in our minds? There's a number of things that let me just throw on the screen real quick because it just, it just says things about God. Because when he, when he forgives, he covers it, he hides it. Uh, the passage in Psalm simply indicates that very quickly. Psalm chapter 31 and verse 1. But also we find that Psalm 103 says that he removes it far away. I don't know about you, but I like that. For the things that God forgives me of, I don't want him, I don't want him to dredge it up on the day of judgment. He moves it far away. He puts it behind him, the passage says in Isaiah. He blots it out. That means it isn't to be brought up again or even thought of again. And as a result, he buries it. We know when we want something taken completely away, we want it buried, we want it taken out of the way. But sometimes we won't let it. And sometimes it just festers within us to the point that we just can't be at peace. You know, I thought about that this, this afternoon as I reviewed my lesson about, about peace. We don't have it on the screen, but turn with me to the book of Philippians. And, and anybody that studies the book of Philippians comes to love the things that Paul says there. In Philippians chapter 4, he says something about what we need to have. It's good to begin with about verse 4 of chapter 4. Listen to what Paul says. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Brethren, I want that. I don't think we can live in this world without that. Turn over. I know verse eight. what verse 8 says, but look at verse 9. Because there, Paul says again, the things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I want that. I don't want to be upset with my brethren or with my neighbor or with my relatives. I, 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 want, I want the peace that passes understanding to be in my life because of what I've learned that God is willing to do for me. He's willing to forgive absolutely, but are we? That's the question. Or will it something that has happened to us just fester within us to the point that we can't function anymore? We can't even come and worship God like we used to because it just works on us and, and keeps us aggravated the whole time. We need to forgive absolutely as well. And then also, God forgives limitlessly I question about using these words but it, it gets to where I want to be we find that God forgives without limits it doesn't matter where we live what we've done how we go about our lives when we come in obedience to the Lord he's willing to forgive us and it brings us back to the book of Romans chapter 5 and every time we read this, we, we wonder why, why we can't understand this or why some people can't understand this. In Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 6, it says, While we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps the good man, someone we even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us. There it is. That's, that's what we want. That's what we find sometimes we can't share with others because we don't seem to have things arranged right. But it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us. That while we're yet sinners, God gave up on us? No. Christ died for us. We don't, we don't need another death. We don't need another sacrifice. This sacrifice has done it for all of us. 
Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. What a passage. Good to be read every day. Because God's willing to forgive me. It's willing to forgive those that we talk to about the gospel. And that is the core of the gospel. Now what's that? What does that mean for for you and me? That means we must forgive without limit when necessary. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 18. There's a few things that Jesus said here that I, I found very applicable to our thoughts tonight. Beginning with verse 21. Matthew chapter 18 again. We find that Peter comes to Jesus, and he's troubled like, like we might well be troubled. Having someone tramped on us, having someone having done us wrong, and we, 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 just, we just nearly blow our top, as it were. Why, why do they do that? Don't they understand how they're supposed to love me and all of that? But let, let, let's, listen to what Peter says. Peter then came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother... How often shall my brother sin against me and I, and I forgive him? Seven times? You know, I could see Peter saying seven times. He probably thought that was, that was over, over and enough. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Now you knew the math, but the point was, When someone comes and seeks forgiveness, you don't say, I'm sorry, but you've used up all your forgiveness. No. You forgive them. And just in case Peter didn't get the thought here, Jesus goes on and says this. He says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had to repayment to be made. That seemed fair, didn't it? And you almost could see Peter listening, coming in closer. And the slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him his debt. But that slave went and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. I put something in my margin. For us today, that's $18. (laughs) And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. And he was unwilling, however, and went and threw him in prison until he should pay that which he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave. I forgave you of all the debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord was moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he could repay all that was owed him. And then we find that Jesus gives the wrap up. He says, so shall my heavenly father do also to you. If each of you does not, Forgive his brother from your heart. That was a lesson that hit Peter right where he needed to be hit. And maybe it's something that hits us right where we need to be hit. That sometimes we just only can see ourselves as we see ourselves in the mirror. And we, 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 we've been hurt. We, we, we've been mistreated. We've been tramped on. And I can't forgive that person until he pays I'll return it to him in the same portion. That's wrong. And that's exactly the parable that Jesus gave causes us to open our eyes and to realize 
Sometimes we treat others unlike what we would like to be treated like. And how important it is. Jesus forgives limitlessly. And we must forgive without limit also ourselves. And Jesus forgives permanently. I think we've already suggested that we don't want these things brought up again. Things that have happened in the past that we've repented of. And the Lord has promised to forgive those things, bury them, cast them away, no longer to remember them, of course. And we find that God forgives sins and never brings them up again. And, and, and it was something that Jeremiah mentioned in Jeremiah 31. But I want to turn over to Hebrews chapter 8 because that's where it's quoted by the writer of the book of Hebrews. And let me just read a portion of that, of that portion. Hebrews chapter 8. Because what, what the Hebrew writer does is to point out that both Jew and Gentile are acceptable to God. The, the Jew, the nation of Jews and, and the nations of the Gentiles were both accepted by God. Notice verse 11, if you will. It says, They shall uh, not everyone teach one his fellow citizens, and everyone his brother, saying, For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That's what God's willing to do. He's willing to forgive us of our sins and remember them no more. Now, what do we learn from that? When God expects us to forgive others, we don't hold that in a very unique place to bring it up again when, when, the, when the situation demands it. We don't do that. That's not what Christians do. We must forgive permanently ourselves. Let's go to the book of Colossians and, and realize that's exactly what, what Paul was saying to the church at Colossae. Colossians chapter 3. Beginning with verse 12 and verse 13, if you're there with me. And it says, And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy, beloved, put on heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. He's talking about you and me. These are the things that we put on. These, these are the things that we have chosen to be a part of and then he says bearing with one another forgiving each other whoever has a complaint against anyone just as the lord forgave you so also should you i, I don't have a problem writing in my bible and so when i come across something like that i take my pen and i underline that so when i come back that jumps out at me because that's talking to me. And I need to make sure that I'm listening to what this writer says and how he's telling us exactly what God expects of us. Let me read that last verse again. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, just so also should you. Yeah, God forgives permanently. And so should we. And then finally, we find that God forgives conditionally. Some would say, well, you should have left that last one off. You mean we have to measure up to what God expects of us for God to forgive us? Indeed. And that's how important it is. God forgives Forgive sins upon the condition of repentance. Now, we could come to this building and sing songs with all of the other people. We could hear people pray. We could hear the sermons being preached. But if we never get around to turning away from our sins, repenting of them, we find that God won't forgive us our sins. And how important that is. Matter of fact, there's a passage found in Psalms chapter 35 and verse 5. Listen as I read that. It says, I acknowledge my sin to you, the psalmist says, and I did not cover 
my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And we have that promise from God. If we turn from our sins and confess to him, if he sees that turn in us, he's willing to forgive us. And often we see that in, in all of the passages we read about, even in the New Testament. So we need to be forgiven when we fulfill God's conditions. For the sinner, we need to repent of our sins. We need to realize that our sin stands between us and God. First and foremost, you know, when we talk to our neighbors or friends or even an acquaintance, we, we say these things out of a heart of love. We don't, we don't say, you're the sinner and I'm, I'm the greater person. We, we don't do that. We say, here's where I've been and here's where I found the grace of God. And for the sinner, they need to recognize what, what has to be done. Turn to Colossians, that last passage we have here. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. You know, when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, he commended them for doing that very thing, turning from their sin. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. He says, in whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Get the page turned here. And it says that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This is the one that forgives us of our sins. This is the one in whom we have redemption. This is the one that we receive the forgiveness of our sins when we come repenting. How important that is. Isn't that what the apostles we have Peter's sermon recorded in Acts chapter 2. In verse 37, we find that he came with the message of redemption. And in Acts chapter 2, in verse 37, we find that these Jews knew who God was. They just needed to repent of their sins. He says, now when they heard this, when they heard the message of Jesus being the divine son of God, the one that they called to have crucified, when they heard this, they were pierced in the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? I remember a number of years ago, my father and I went and had a Bible study with this husband and wife. And we went through the book of Acts. We got all the way to Acts chapter 10, which tells us about Cornelius. And how Peter went to the house of Cornelius and preached the gospel to him and his household. And how when they heard the truth, they became Christians. The next appointment that we came to that two individuals. And we sat down at their kitchen table with our Bibles open. To pick up where we left off there in Acts chapter 10. And I says to Emmett, the husband. I will come to the house of Cornelius. And he said, no. I nearly fell off my chair. We had seen the message of truth and how individuals turn from their sin, confess Jesus as Lord, and enter the waters of baptism and have their sins washed away. But Emmy, Emmett and Betty said no. And they're no longer in this world. And it, it pains my heart to, to know that people saw the truth, but that something in their heart said no. And there may be like people like that tonight that hear the truth, but they just don't want to be a part of that. You know someone like that probably. Maybe you've talked to them. Maybe you've invited them to come to worship. But there's something about them that says when, when they hear the truth, maybe you've said something to them about you can't get to heaven unless you come and obey Jesus Christ and are washed by his blood. And they say, no. And you wonder why they can't see what you've seen. 
But we have to be long-suffering. <laughs> we continued to study with Betty and Emmett, but we soon found that uh, they didn't want it to come back. But we can't give up on mankind. We have to keep on preaching. We have to keep on teaching. And what about the sinning Christian? In Acts chapter 8, we find that was the case with, with Peter and John when they came to Samaria. And in Acts chapter 8, we find that it speaks concerning a Christian that had, had responded to the preaching of Philip. In Acts chapter 8, we find that when they saw Peter and John and the things that they had done with the power of God, he wanted to buy it with money. He sinned. <laughs> and when we begin reading there in Acts chapter 8, we find that Peter said to him in verse 22, he says, Therefore repent of the wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, if that possible, that the in, in, intentions of your heart may be forgiven you. Sometimes we as Christians, we, we falter, we do wrong, and we come back asking God to forgive us. We're going to sing the invitation song in just a moment. And every time that we come together, we find it only right to extend the invitation of the Lord. But it doesn't just, it isn't just extended when we're here at the building. How many times have individuals been roused out of their beds and a person says, I want to become a Christian now. <laughs> I still remember when we left the building there in Hilliard and got halfway home that my oldest son said, Dad, I want to become a Christian. We turned the car around right then and there, went back to the building, and he became a Christian. Maybe that's the case with some tonight. You finally realize that now is the time to become a child of God, for God to forgive me, and for me to learn the lesson that I need to be able to forgive others when they sin against me. If we can assist anyone this evening in doing that, we ask that you may come. While together we stand and sing.